votes. Uh, two quick things before I start my uh, presentation. Um, uh, first is uh, two observations, actually. Uh, earlier this morning, I heard someone remark that one of the problems or uh, disadvantages of giving a talk late in a conference is that many things have already, uh, uh, many things that you wanted to discuss or, or coming have already uh, been brought up. So right now, I feel a little bit like I'm a cover band playing the greatest hits of Mark Twain criticism. <laughs> so just bear with me for that. The other, uh, the other thing is, um, we're talking about Mark Twain's relevance. Uh, this morning, the New York Times has a photo uh, a photojournalism piece about reading across America. And in Morningside Heights, they have a picture of a gentleman reading Roughing It. I think Mark Twain is doing fine. Um, I'll start with my talk now. In the age of surveillance capitalism, Shoshana Suboff outlines how our digital activity is compiled into massive databases and sold to the highest bidder. This data, transformed by artificial intelligence into predictions, fill the shadow texts that invisibly chart and control our lives. As evidence of this control, she offers Cambridge Analytica's illegal harvest of Facebook data for Trump's 2016 campaign, which showed how such a text can exploit using emotions and target their inner demons. But what about other kinds of data, other texts? Yes, AI can arrange and select data and show patterns, but can it analyze the historical and contemporary relevance or echoes of a particular text? To answer these kinds of questions, a different kind of intelligence is necessary. LI, or literary intelligence. The algorithm of choice, sociological criticism. Kenneth Burke famously asserted that by shaping and reflecting attitudes and culture, uh, literature offered situations and strategies which, when applied to contemporaneous attitudes and cultures, provide, in his oft-quoted phrase, equipments for living. More recently, and in keeping with Burke's notion of contemporaneous connections, Rita Felsky affirms that past texts have things to say on questions that matter to us. This essay is a dialogue between past and present, bringing cultural criticism to bear on questions that matter, and looking back to the textual past for explanations, or at least strategies, to explain our current social situations. The insights of sociology, public opinion, and cognitive psychology, when applied to a historical text, in this case, uh, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, create an interpretive bridge, revealing how literature illuminates and informs the pressing issues of today. Uh, for many academics, the questions that matter today revolve around Trumpism, the loose ideological baggage of the former president's base, an embrace of authoritarianism and white supremacy, and a grim mixture of entitlement, aggrievement, and conspiracy. Given our current political slash cultural climate, with its warnings about and even calls for a second civil war, the novel, with its satiric condemnation of the attitudes that led to the civil war and the failed reconstruction, reads like a gloss on our current acrimony. Twain's satiric tone and method is crucial to this interpretation. As Jocelyn Chadwick Joshua argues in The Gym, uh, Gym Dilemma, misconceptions about Twain works generally, and Jim in particular, result because of the failure to recognize and acknowledge the conventions of satire at play in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This emphasis on satire, combined with the sociological approach of Burke and Felsky, reveals the predictive power of the novel. It captures Americans' embrace of racism, love of the easy lie and the scalawags who perpetuate it, a turn toward victimization, and a visceral attachment to false narrative. In this, it explains how 19th century hucksters can be born again in the 21st century. The satire begins with Huck's narrative voice. Much like the character Stephen Colbert in the Colbert Report, it presents itself as one of them, in the novel's case, average white southerners, and then ironically exposes their hypocrisies and cruelties, mainly that people could be property. 
A short passage midway through the novel captures this technique. Huck recounts how Jim came right out flat-footed and said he would steal his children, children that belonged to a man I didn't even know, a man that had never done me no more. 19th century readers gladdened that the war against secession had ended slavery, and who could detect irony and satire, might breathe a sigh of relief that slave fathers no longer had to resort to theft to keep their families intact. Those still bitter about the war of northern aggression and who had trouble with irony might get a bit riled up, sharing Huck's indignation as they remembered a time when states' rights ruled and blacks knew their place in chains and on the farm. This satirical double dealing is educative. Through it, readers experience the moral journey of Huck's gradual, though ultimately limited, acceptance of Jim's humanity. That limitation, the color line. At the end of the novel, Huck offers what he thinks is the highest 19th century compliment to Jim. I knew he was white inside. In the next century, James Baldwin captured the endurance of this reality, noting that before white America can accept blacks, it insists they cease to be Negroes. Huck's renunciation of Jim's identity is part of the much maligned final chapters where a literal reading can have modern critics and readers chafing at Jim's prolonged enslavement. Yet it is in these chapters that Twain's lesson becomes most relevant. Just as the Colbert Report was a meta-commentary on the irrationality of Fox News talking heads, the final third of the novel is a meta-commentary on the irrationality of life in Jim Crow America. The 14th Amendment left blacks free, but still imprisoned by people like Tom and Huck, who could not separate fact, blacks are full citizens, from the fiction of their own prejudices. In this, in this, the novel captures the zeitgeist of a nation where a creeping tide of racial hatred led Twain to write the United States of Lynchardom. Uh, the essay sheds light on Huck's complicity in Jim's treatment. Twain argues that most people are intrinsically moral but lack the courage of their convictions. In his telling, quote, each man is afraid of his neighbor's disapproval, a thing which is more dreaded than wounds and death. This influence of social cohesion on decision making reflects Huck's own logic when he finds Jim imprisoned at the Felt Farm. His instinct is to write Miss Watson. What stops him, as Twain notes, his neighbor's disapproval. Huck worries that once someone finds out that he helped a slave to freedom, I'd be ready to get down and lick his boots for shame. For Huck, fear of abasement at first triumphs over, over morality. In this, Huck exemplifies current understanding on group affiliation and decision making. As the bluntly titled, Tribalism is Human Nature makes clear, groups are particularly prone to giving status to individuals who conform to and vocalize support for moral norms and deducting status from individuals who rebel and vocalize dissent against those norms. Huck, living in a liminal state between the starch and polish of Widow Douglas and the smooth and lovely freedom of the raft, is at first more starched, more interested in maintaining his status as a white, racist, civilized southerner. But after considering the matter further and recalling their bonds of affection and above all thinking, he famously renounces what he sees as his Christian or social duty to treat a man like property and turn in Jim Instead, he rejects social norms and makes a conscious or moral decision to become a Southern apostate and famously go to hell. The social pressure to fall into line that Huck rejects and Twain believes is embedded in the American experience was aided and abetted by news media which preyed upon white anxieties of blacks asserting their rights. The leaders of the white KKK, a high, excuse me, the leaders of the white league, a highbrow KKK, fashioned tales of ur urban apocalypse, reporting in 1880 that in New Orleans, quote, there were outrages committed on the street day after day. Houses were robbed two or three times a winter. Our ladies had no protection on the streets, particularly in the daytime. These fictions fueled violent reactions then and now. 
The fears underlying the White League returned to Louisiana just over 100 years later as false narratives of a, of a post-Katrina black crime wave in New Orleans became standard news fare. More recently, they appeared in the midst of cities looted and burning after Black Lives Matter protests. In both centuries, fear fiction became the dominant social narrative. In the novel, these delusions reveal themselves through Tom and by extension all unreconstructed Southerners lost in an imagined past. Tom wants to make America great by reverting to a fictional world. Early in the book, Huck captures uh, Tom's reality, a reality that centers on an all too familiar racist fiction, a caravan of brown skinned people invading America. As Huck recounts it, Tom tells his game, quote, that next day a whole parcel of Spanish merchants and rich Arabs were come coming to camp in Cave Hollow. Huck, wanting to see the diamonds, camels, and elephants, went with the gang only to discover that it weren't anything but a Sunday school picnic. We busted it up and chased the children up the hollow, but we never got anything but some donuts and jam, though Ben Rogers got a rag doll and Joe Harper got a hymn book and a track. So, here we find a leader imposing his fantasy world of riches and success if only an invasion of dusky foreigners could be routed. And this, Twain illustrates how delusion and prejudice can override evenly seemingly impregnable cultural walls. Tom is so blinded that even in this most religious of times and locales, 19th century America, he persuades his gang to, one, attack a Sunday school class, and two, steal religious texts. This helps explain how our modern president leading a hedonistic lifestyle, running casinos, serial marriages, bragging about groping women, could find support from an evangelical Christians. Twain, getting the jump on cognitive theorists, understood that for people like Tom, the power of a story, particularly one you want to believe, trumps reality. Psychologist Nassim Nicholas Talib notes that such narrative fallacies exploit our vulnerability to overinterpretation and our predilection for compact stories over raw truths. This leads to severe distortions in our mental representation of the world. The core American fallacy that Twain exposes in Huckleberry Finn is that blacks are not citizens, actually not even human, and thus should not be accorded the same rights as white Americans. His parade of narrative deceptions throughout the novel, the attack on the Sunday school picnic, Huck's evasions, the Duke, Duke and the Dauphin scams, all illustrate the sheer gullibility of 19th century Americans and how easy it is to fool some other people most of the time. They point to Twain's understanding that the compact stories in Huck Finn create a perfect vehicle to expose America's distaste for the raw truths of life for black Americans, both, both pre and post reconstruction. The connections to contemporary America are fairly direct. We had a president who came into office peddling wild tales about a brown skinned immigrant crime wave. Since their reality is mediated through Trump, his audience saw Mexican immigrants as rapists and constructed narratives to fit it. Consider Ivan Green, an upstate, um, upstate New York factory worker. He's all in on the wall. His rationale, it's straight out of Game of Thrones. Quote, I'd hate for somebody to come over here and rape my daughter, murder her, murder my mom, and then go back over there and not get caught. So yeah, I think the wall's a great idea. Safe in small town New England, where South and Central American immigrants are few and far between, Green fabricates a lurid narrative which echoes the lurid narratives, narratives he's been fed. The fervid inventions of Green reveals the pernicious effect of another cognitive fallacy, the distinction between possibility and plausibility. One of the most powerful cognitive errors, it generates logical confusion by imbuing the ridiculous with a patina of credibility. Yes, Green's fantastical tale of murder and mayhem is within the realm of possibility, 
But the likelihood of a Mexican immigrant crossing the border, traveling almost 2,000 miles, committing a rape, double murder, and then escaping undetected in Me to back to Mexico tilts toward the impossible. Behavioral economist Daniel Kahneman's description of availability bias comes into play here. With a steady stream of stories about MS-13 or Antifa coming soon to a town near you, Green's Guard is up. It's all over the news. Even the president says it's true. It is available and thus is at the forefront of his mind. The problem, as Kahneman explains and Green shows, is that availability cascades inevitably lead to gross exaggerations of minor threats. Twain exploits this tension between possibility and probability in the Duke and Dauphin's deceptions. In the Wilkes chapters, the Dauphin, despite a ludicrously corn poem British accent, succeeds in convincing Peter Wilkes's daughters and most of the townspeople that he and the Duke are their father's long-lost English brothers. All it takes is a false narrative that he picked up from a young chap. The only holdouts, the elites, Dr. Robinson, the Laurie Levi, Levi Bell, and their set. Robinson sees through the tears and flap doodle of the Dauphin and warns the sisters, he is the thinnest kind of an imposter, has come here with a lot of empty names and facts which he picked up somewhere and you take them for proofs. The Wilkes daughter and the townspeople's respond to this revelation of the truth. They called it fake news. Mary, Han Mary Jane thrust the bag of gold coins into the Duke's arms, telling him, take this $6,000 and invest it for me and my sisters any way you want to, and don't give us no receipt for it. In the following chapter, he makes clear how the hucksters feel about the rubes. The Dauphin dismisses the Duke's concerns. Cuss the doctor. What do, we, what do we care for him? Ain't we got all the fools in town on our side? And ain't that a big enough majority in any town? Majority brings us back to 21st century America, particularly electoral majorities who reject the advice of those they perceive hold them in contempt. Take, for example, 60-year-old retiree Pam Schilling. Like the Wilkes sisters, she's suffering from a recent loss, a son dead from a heroin overdose. And like the Wilkes sisters, Schilling supports a huckster. Asked about Trump, she replied, I think he's doing a great job, and I just wish to hell they'd leave him alone and let him do it. In true American fashion, she takes it a step further. Echoing the rejection and disdain for those who dub the quality, Schilling adds, he shouldn't have to take any shit from anybody. Those anybodies, they look suspiciously like Dr. Robinson and Lawyer Bell. Or as New York farmer and hardcore Trump supporter Maurice Bertrand snorts, smart asses with their college degrees. Twain anticipates this distrust in the political economy chapter where Pat excoriates American democracy when he finds out that a black professor who could talk all kinds of languages and know everything could vote when he was at home in Ohio. Twain rightfully places race at the center of this debate. Pat doesn't want to prevent the professor from voting because of his education. Even though Pat shares, along with contemporary Trump supporters, a distinct distrust of the educated, the deciding factor for Pat is that he is black. As he snarls, when they told me there was a state in this country where they let that mm, vote, I draw it out. I says, I'll never vote again. State laws and mandates to ensure voting rights are part of a system he believes works against good old boys like himself. His white grievance is reflected today in people like Republican Senator of Arkansas, Tom Cotton, who looks back on slavery as a necessary evil. And let's just pause for a second. Someone with the last name of Cotton in the 21st century saying slavery is a necessary evil shows that some people just have no sense of themselves, no sense of what's coming out of their mouths, I guess. Um, and in the post-2020 flurry of Republican voting restrictions that target black voters. And of course, Pap's politics and angry grievances align with the horde storming Congress at the January 6th insurrection. While it is easy to dismiss Pap's exaggerated characterization, as a caricature, he merely openly articulates the racist sentiments many felt. 
The Washington Times, a pro-Trump newspaper, and a 2015 editorial captures this PAP slash Trump mirror, writing that Trump is, quote, only saying in a coarse way what millions of Americans think. And what of the other scalawags of the novel? Do Twain readers identify with the townspeople who were duped or with the Duke and Dauphin, with the shills or with the con men? Much like uh, those today who embrace the deplorable label, Tom, the character most lost in delusions, revels in his masochism. By the end of the novel, half dead from a rifle ball in his calf, he is Gladys of all. Reality had caught up with him at the point of a gun, and he rejoices because it was what he wanted all along. Apparently, Trump knows that his supporters, like Tom, would welcome a bullet in the leg. And this is not just hyperbole. When asked to choose between government funding to provide clean water for his town or for the Mexican wall, Jim Fink of Strong City, Kansas, told the reporter, if you ask me would I rather see the money go for our water plan or to possibly try to control our borders and the security of our nation, the security of our nation is more important to me. In a choice between unrealized, xenophobic, free-floating anxiety and potable water, White nationalism leaves Trump supporters dry. <laughs> I'm left wondering if people like Fink, Schilling, and others will continue to live in a Sawyer-esque altered state where a bullet in the leg is worth holding on to delusions. Unfortunately for them and many others, fiction still rules. 70% of Republicans believe Joe Biden did not win the election. Yet Huckleberry Finn remains reminding readers that fiction can both create lies and expose truths. As Kenneth Burke would say, it provides the mental equipment citizens need to navigate these perilous times. From its publication on through today, the novel captures America's contrarian impulses, impulses both anti-democratic and redemptive. Interpreting these impulses through the scarifying lens of predictive satire reveals the power of literary intelligence and the continuing relevance of Huck Finn. Thank you.